This program is made possible by the generous partners of Dwayne Miller Ministries. Stay tuned for a message that will strengthen your faith. Get ready for insightful teachings, uplifting testimonies, and practical wisdom that will encourage you to live in victory. Welcome to Today with Dwayne and Cameron Miller. Hey, Pastor Dwayne, along with my beautiful bride, Cameron, we want to invite you into a Sunday service. This has been previously recorded, but it is one of our Sunday services. And this message, I pray, is going to be a blessing to you as well as the atmosphere of our congregation. So God bless you as you join us in one of our Sunday services. We think, well, isn't that nice? This person got healed or this person got delivered. But the fact is, is that there is an underlying kingdom principle in everything he did whose outreaching effect we still live under today. Remember, as a rabbi with authority, as a rabbi with Shemekah, he was establishing the rules of the kingdom of God forever. He was shifting Judaism out of religion into a relationship with the Father, and he was shifting all of us into a kingdom. The greatest tragedy of the American church is that we have spent almost our entire existence 250 years building our kingdoms instead of building his kingdom. We've built Baptist kingdoms and Assembly of God kingdoms and Catholic kingdoms and you name it kingdoms. We've built massive ministry kingdoms. But Jesus is about the Father's kingdom. Now in Mark chapter 4 verse 11 and I'm going to be all over chapter 4 and back in chapter 3 at the end and chapter 5 some. Jesus made this radical statement. And you have to understand in Mark chapter 4 he gives really the one single parable of his ministry. Because he said here all the other parables are an outworking of this one, the, the seed and the sower. But in Mark chapter 4, verse 11, he makes this profound statement. And he said to them, now remember, when he, when he speaks, that becomes law. Because he's not just the Messiah, he is a rabbi who graduated from rabbinical school, who has had two miracles that gave him a status in Hebrew called Shmika, which is authority, which means he's the only man alive who has the authority to interpret the Torah to the people. And so when he said to them, here's a law of the kingdom. So he said to them, to you, it has been given to know the mystery, singular, the one mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside the kingdom, they learn, or I speak to them in parables. They are outside, so all things come to them in parables. If I were to tell you that what Jesus is about to say and do is the one single mystery of his entire kingdom, how many of you would believe that's very important to know what that is? Now, there are a lot of mysteries in the kingdom. There are a lot of mysteries um, in his ministry. Dr. Ron Phillips wrote a great book years ago about unlocking mysteries, and uh, he's forgotten more than I'll ever know about the scripture, but his book on the mysteries of God are just mind-boggling. But there's one single mystery that Jesus is telling them. He said, it's been given to you. Everybody say, to me. It's, in other words, it's possible for you to know and operate in the single greatest mystery of my kingdom to unlock the fullness of my kingdom in your life. What is that mystery? Well, I'm going to tell you at the end. We like to say to someone that we're intimate with, especially if it's juicy gossip, I'm going to tell you a secret. What Jesus is saying here is I'm going to show you a secret. Because he's not just going to tell them about the mystery, he's going to show it to them in their personal life, in the events that they're about to experience. So, 
in order to find out what this mystery is, we have to go back to chapter 3. And in chapter number 3, the Bible said in verse 13, and he went up to the mountain and he called to him those he himself wanted. That should be a revelation that causes you to shout. That Jesus calls those to himself that he wants. That before the foundation of the world, he chose you to be in him. That when you were lost and undone and a sinner who is dead, spiritually dead in trespasses and sin, and you couldn't even know that you needed God, he loved you enough to quicken your spirit and awaken you to the reality that you needed a Savior. You know, we should never get over that. We should never become so deep that we get over the fact that Jesus wanted me. He wanted you. He called you. His spirit reached out and quickened my spirit when I was nine years old and revealed the fact to me that I was a sinner, lost and undone, headed to hell, and the Holy Spirit wooed me in the love of Jesus Christ to repent and to receive him as Lord and Savior. And listen, I look at so much of the strife and the division and the issues and the problems in the American church. And it could all be resolved if we would just come back to the reality of how great it was for Jesus Christ to call our name and to be born again. Hallelujah. So he called those that he wanted and he appointed 12. Now, If you've ever said, I just wish I knew the will of God for my life. I'd just do God's will if I knew what he wanted me to do. Well, he's about to tell you right here. This is his will, that they might be with him. Everybody say intimacy. Intimacy. It's what Cameron spoke about in the beginning. You know, it really doesn't make any difference how gifted you are, how anointed and talented you are. It doesn't really make any difference how much money you can give or how many souls you lead to Jesus or what great things you can do in his kingdom if you're not intimate with him. I promise you, the rug will get pulled out from under you and you'll fall flat on your face. I've never known one minister in ministry to fall morally that doesn't come back and say it began when I stopped being intimate with the Father. I'm preaching better than you're shouting. It's hard to live in sin, rebellion, and in a backslidden condition when you're intimate with the Father moment by moment every day. You see, you can get rid of legalism and legalistic religious rules if you just have intimacy with the Father because I'll tell you, while it's not my job to be your Holy Spirit and tell you how to live your life, He will lead you and guide you to walk in righteousness, not out of legalistic religious conduct, but out of intimacy. Because just as Cameron said, and just as I would say to you, when I was a teenager, the thing, there were two things that kept me from being worse than I was. One was I knew that Jerry Miller had a 42-inch leather belt that would chastise me back into fellowship with him. But I also had enough respect for my father, not just because he was a pastor, but I had enough respect for he and my mother that I didn't want to do anything to disgrace their name. Amen. 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 He called you to be with him, to spend time with him. And then that he might send them out to preach. He called you to preach. Everybody say, well, I'm not called to preach. Yes, you are. Right here is living proof. You're called, the word preach is herald. It's what we got our English word herald from, to to go before the king and proclaim great things he has done for you. You say, well, I don't know the Bible. You don't have to know the Bible. I suggest you learn the Bible, but I also tell you that if you have a testimony, you can tell someone what Jesus has done for you. And by, by the way, if he's called you to preach, it means he's given you an audience. This is a funny Baptist joke. Maybe you'll not find it so funny. (laughs) Now listen, I believe in, there's no difference between male and female. I believe in women ministers and ministers and pastors and apostles and, you know, like Clay Nash jokes, he says, you know, I don't believe in women apostles, but I sure have served with a lot of them. (laughs) 
But an old Baptist joke is a lady came to her Baptist pastor one time and said, you know, pastor, I believe the Lord's called me to preach. And of course, Baptists don't believe in women preachers by and large. And he just, he said, he sure has. And your 12 children are your congregation. <laughs> now y'all don't find that funny, but I, I had to be corny at least once. He called you and he sent you out to preach and to have power. Yes. He called you to spend time with him to herald the good news of his kingdom and who the king is and to have power, dunamis. You know, I'm thankful that when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost that you release a prayer language that allows you to pray in the perfect will of the Father. But that's not what he said would be the most obvious evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. He said, you'll go to Jerusalem and be endued with power. Yes. Don't tell me how much you speak in tongues if there's not any dunamis, any dynamite power in your life to heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons. And oh, by the way, and to just walk in Love, joy, peace, gentleness, patience, meekness, kindness, and self-control. Some of the meanest people I've ever known in church speak in tongues. I'm shout preaching better than you're shouting. I've seen people get the Holy Ghost in the altar, flip and flop like a crop in the bottom of a flat top boat. Get greased up with enough oil to have a fish fry on their skin, speak in tongues until the lights go out, walk out in the parking lot and cuss somebody out because they cut them off getting out of the parking lot. Hello. Thank you. I'll preach. I'll keep preaching it too. I mean, really. So he said, I've called you to have power to do what? To have power to cast out demons and to heal sicknesses. So there's the will of God for your life. So he calls the 12 to spend time with him. And he calls the 12 to preach the gospel. And he calls the 12 to have power. Power that will manifest in healing the sick and casting out demons. That should be the testimony of your life. You don't want to get around this person, if you got a demon, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to show. And they're going to cast it out of you. Hallelujah. But if you're taking notes, point number one, this is the, one of the things that will lead you to unlock the mystery of the kingdom. You have to understand that every anointing and every assignment always has opposition. If you think that God's going to call you, equip you, and enable you, and the devil's not going to fight you, Amen. well, let me just back up. And your own flesh is not even going to fight you. Hello. Amen. You're going to have to get your flesh in check. Because God's going to call you to do some things your flesh don't want to do. Amen. So for every anointing or every assignment, however you want to say it, there's always opposition. So go back over to chapter four. I promise this is going to get better here in a minute. Good. Pretty good, man. But I got a taxi before I take off. <laughs> so you go over to chapter four and Jesus is teaching the disciples the one single parable that I, and I preached on it last year very thoroughly about the seed and the sower. And I don't have time to go back through that, but you just, you know, the seed is the word and there are four types of soil, which represent men's hearts. And he's talking about sowing the word. And when you sow the word, some people are not going to receive it at all. And when you sow the word, some are going to receive it. And uh, then the sun's going to come out and dry it up and it's going to go by the wayside. Yeah, you're going to sow some among rocky soil and they're going to receive it. But the Bible said the cares of this world are going to steal that harvest from them for tribulation's sake, the Bible says, it's going, you can bet when God calls you, gives you a word, equips you, anoints you, puts you in a position, the very thing that's going to happen next is the enemy is coming with tribulation and persecution and testing. And the Lord didn't cause it, but he's going to see 
if you're willing to throw in the towel just because it gets tough. This thing called the spirit-filled life is not a life for sissies, I promise you. And if you're thin-skinned and you get your feelings hurt easily, I got news for you. You'll be better off to go back to the bar and stay there on the weekends because if you get in this army and you go to battle in this army, you've got enemies and opposition going to come at you every day of your life. But you learn in intimacy with him how to operate in power and you can reach a place in your life where the enemy leaves you alone because he understands you're not going to yield to it. So there's opposition. There's the seed and the sower. And he talks about the 30, 60, and the 100-fold return. Cameron and I were talking on the way here today about a passage in Mark 10 that she brought up. She may talk about that in the future where the Lord talks about, and this is a 100-fold return. She asked me the question, isn't it the will of God for all of us to live in the 100-fold? Absolutely. Absolutely. But almost no one does. Because most people operate in 30-fold faith and some people don't operate in any fold faith. But there's 30, 60, and 100. And in this parable, the soil determines the level of the harvest. You're going to sow. He's telling them, some of you are going to have 30%. You're going to win 30% of the people you sow the word into. Some of you are going to get 60. But my goal is for none to perish and for all to live in my word. See, we're not responsible for the harvest. We're responsible for obedience. I, I don't say this just out of preacher talk. If you're sick and I pray for you, I'm 100% convinced that when I pray for you, you're going to be healed. Well, does everyone get healed when you pray for them? No, and neither does everyone get saved when I preach the gospel. But that's my goal, is to have 100-fold. And by the way, 100-fold is not 100%. That would be good. But 100-fold is if, if you take a handkerchief and you fold it once, you now have two. So you fold it twice, you've got four. And you fold it a third time, you've got 16. You fold it a fourth time, there's 32. A 100-fold return just on a thousand dollar seed is countless millions. Don't tell me our God's not a God of abundance. He said, my goal is for you to live in the hundredfold abundant overflow of my kingdom. And he's not broke. He's not in heaven wringing his hands, wondering what he's going to do for his children in this upside down economy in America. These idiots on the news can keep lying to me about the economy all they want to, but I've been to the grocery store. I didn't have to listen to Elmer Fudd on the State of the Union because I know the State of the Union when I put the holes in my gas tank and I buy a loaf of bread at the store, for God's sake. I'm not an idiot. This liberal leftist media can just stop their lies because I'm not an idiot. But I don't live as a citizen of the United States of America, I'm a citizen of a kingdom. And a king that's not broke, he's not concerned, he's not worried. Hallelujah. And my best days are about to break loose. See, don't you understand that when you're about to come into your destiny, things are going to get tighter and tougher and harder, and the enemy's going to get louder. But he's just a roaring lion. He can't even bite you. He don't even have teeth in his mouth unless you put them in there. All he can do is accuse you. If you get bitten by him, it's your fault. Through your doubt and unbelief and fear and anxiety, I'm preaching better than you're shouting. So for every assignment, there's going to be opposition. In this passage of Scripture, he explains the only parable Jesus ever explained, and he explained it by the conditions of the heart. And then he says in verse number 26, and I didn't give this to them, but he he just said, the kingdom of God is if a man should scatter seed on the ground. And then it's going to yield crops. When the grain ripens, he's going to have a harvest. You know, the beautiful thing about God's kingdom is, is you cannot fail unless you fail to sow. 
If you don't have enough seed in your life to sow, it's because you're not sowing, because God gives seed to the sower. And I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about the Word. You and I have perpetual harvest in our life as long as we sow. You can sow love and kindness and gentleness and patience and meekness and all of those. You can sow the Word. You can sow financially. I'm going to get to this in a minute. And so the Bible tells us that he took the disciples in verse 35. This is where Karen, uh, Cameron, I'll, I'll get her name out in a minute. Okay, think of my wife's name. <laughs> Well, I'm still trying to get over the young and the restless. <laughs> In verse 35, and on the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now listen, Jesus has told them about the kingdom and how the kingdom operates. And now he's about to show it to them. Your destiny is on the other side of the lake. For those of us who have been to Israel and you've stood on the Sea of Galilee, if you, if you remember standing there when we were about to get on that boat and go out into the Sea of Galilee, right straight across the lake is Gadara, 11 miles. You can see the Golan Heights and the mountain range. You can see the other side on a clear day. And he says to them, we have a destiny on the other side. Let us go to the other side. And so when they left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were with him. Pause for a moment. This, if you don't know how to read the Bible and you don't understand the context, this is a great act of faith on the part of the disciples. The Bible said that he said, we're going to the other side 11 miles. And the Bible said earlier in the chapter that he had asked Peter for one of his small fishing boats. It's, um, you know, about the size of someone's bass boat here in America. They'd take the small fishing boat out with the larger vessel. They would get in the small boat, cast their nets, pull in the fish. But this boat's not equipped to go across the lake. It's just equipped to be pulled along behind the big boat and used to fish out of. But if you're going to make that 11-mile journey, it's not equipped to go there. And Peter and Andrew and James and John are commercial fishermen. And they understand that this boat is not the boat you take 11 miles across the lake. But the Bible said when he told them, we're going to the other side, they took him as he was. They, yeah. they got in the boat that they knew was not capable of making the journey, but because they knew he was the son of God, they believed in his word, they took him at his word, and they got in that boat to go to the other side. So they began the journey in great faith. But then the Bible says... A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat the boat, and it was already filling. It was filling up with water. So here we go. Isn't it wonderful to serve Jesus? He's called us to preach. He's called us to spend time with. He's called us to have power. He's promised us a harvest. Isn't it great? And the first thing that happens when I get in the boat with him, a storm comes He's already tested their character. Whenever he called them to be his disciples, remember? And then he called Matthew, the tax collector, who's been stealing money from those four men their whole life. And he said, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to have to forgive this guy. Yeah. So they passed that test. Yep. And now he's going to challenge the test of their life. Watch this, to see if their vision can remain heavenly and eternal and kingdom rather than earthly, physical, and natural. That's good. Amen. That's good. Because if you judge what God's assignment is in your life by what happens in the natural, what happens in the earthly, what happens in the physical, 
you're not going to make it to the other side. You have to understand that every assignment, every anointing has opposition. And that opposition is not even your enemy. It's God's enemy. So they get in this boat. And now the wind and the waves are filling the boat with water. What do you do when you're in a storm? Well, the first thing you better do is find Jesus. If you look at that next verse, where was Jesus? He was in the stern. He was in the pilot seat. When you find Jesus, number two, you better focus on Jesus. What was he doing? Sleeping. Here they are, stressed out, about to lose their mind. God, don't you, they're going to say in a moment, aren't you even worried about us? We're going to die. We're going to drown. Jesus is over here sleeping through the things that you think are going to kill you. You're all stressed out. And rightfully so sometimes. I mean, when the enemy comes to literally try to kill you, you had better keep your eternal, supernatural faith level and perspective in place because, listen, the only thing that's going to put lungs in a premature baby when they said the baby can't even have lungs at this point of development is the supernatural power of God. When you're lying in a hospital bed and the demons are trying to kill you, you better understand that this is a demonic warfare. It's not any diagnosis. It's not pneumonia. It's not the flu. It's not your fever. It's not cancer. It's not what man says about it. It is a demonic force trying to keep you from the other side, from your destiny. The mystery of the kingdom is about this, this battle. Karen and I thank you for joining us in today's broadcast where we previously recorded a sermon on Sunday. And we hope it was a blessing to you to come into our congregation and our atmosphere on a Sunday morning service. Until next time, God bless you. To contact this ministry, visit our website at www.dwaynemiller.com. You can email us at info at or send your letters to Post Office Box 1331 Cabot, Arkansas 72023. We would love to pray for you. If you need prayer, please call 888-997-2387. Please join us in person at The Edge Church on Sundays at 1030 a.m. We are located at 6702 TP White Drive, Cabot, Arkansas 72023. This program is available to watch on demand. Visit our website, YouTube channel, or the following streaming platforms to catch up on any episodes you may have missed. To stay connected with us, follow us on social media. Find us on Facebook at Dwayne Miller Ministries or on X at Dr. Underscore Dwayne Miller. This program was made possible by the generous partners of Dwayne Miller Ministries. If this broadcast is a blessing to you, please consider partnering with us. You can text GIVE at 501-237-5676 or give online at www.dwaynemiller.com. Thanks for watching Today with Dwayne and Cameron Miller.